But when we're coming to the velodrome, there are still a couple of girls, right, that had just sat on all day, the FDJ girl, the SD Works girl. So when we're coming in, I have also this really competitive side of me where it's like, mm. I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure that the, yeah. no, these yeah. girls do not win. And after um, racing for Bansonville with um, Marta, she, you know, she comes up to me and she goes like, you know, congratulations, congratulations. I'm so glad you won. And it's like, oh, yeah. like thank, thank you. And she's like, because I didn't want any of those other girls who didn't pull through to win. And I was like, I feel you. Well, that was the episode I did with Alison Jackson last week. I'm dubbing her as Miss Paru Bay. I don't know. What do you guys think? There's only been three editions. How can you have a Miss Paru Bay already? But I think it was the way she won her last three editions. I don't care anyway. I'm throwing it out there. Welcome to the podcast, guys. This is Talking Luft. I'm Mitch Stocker. And the podcast is being brought to you by Rafa, our proud partner. I worked with Rafa when I was writing professionally with EF Education First, and I thought that was all about kit. I didn't really need to know much more about the company. I just got the kit. I love the kit, and I just rode in it. Since retiring, I've continued to work with Rafa in the podcast, but also out there in the community, and I'm loving how they engage with the community. That's what they're about, telling the story, engaging with the RCC, the Rafa Cycling Club. Like I said, this is Talking Luft, and of course, well, maybe not of course, but I have got for you Alison Jackson here on Talking Luft. She is one that I always wanted to have on Talking Luft, and I'm glad that I got her. Well done, Alison, winning Roubaix, making sure that I got you on the podcast, but you didn't necessarily need to do that because I wanted you on Talking Luft anyway, and we got you, and it was an awesome episode, and it is an awesome episode, I meant to say. Have a listen, guys. Now, you've heard me talk about AG1 this year as something that I used to use when I was racing pro, but something that I'm using also now since retiring. And I'm actually wondering how many of you have actually gone out and tried it? Because I'd love to hear your feedback and see if you're actually enjoying AG1 as much as I do. I really like it. I really just like the simple routine of it. I get up with the kids about 6.30 in the morning. I walk out. I turn the coffee machine on. I grab my AG1 shaker, fill it up with water, drop a couple of ice cubes in it, a scoop of the AG1 mix, shake it up. Now, this might sound crazy, but I'm doing the push for better push-up challenge this month. So I drop down and I knock out my first set of the day, gulp half of my AG1, then drop down and do a few more push-ups and then finish my AG1 drink. My kids are looking across at me at this point. Who is this crazy man? But I love it. It's a great way to start the day and I feel ready to go. AG1 is a foundation of health and that's why I love it. It's more than just greens. It's a comprehensive blend of vitamins and minerals, probiotics, superfood complexes. It helps provide digestive support, immunity support, metabolism, energy and stress support. I've continued to take AG1 because it's not just for elite sports people. It's for anyone who wants to feel good about themselves and make sure they're covering all their nutritional bases. If a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, the AG1 is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go across to drinkag1.com slash life in the peloton. That's drink ag1.com slash life in the peloton and get yourself your first purchase now guys i'm not going to blab on anymore sit back and enjoy this one this is talking luft here's allison jackson all right here we go allison this is the fun stuff we've got you for talking luft it was great to have you on the big pod last week but now it's time to know you a little bit more. Welcome to Talking Luft. Do you know what we're up for this week? Well, it's always a little bit random, I think, but um, looking forward to it. All right. I'll run you through how it goes. Most of the people listening know how this is. I change it up a little bit depending on what the guest is and how organized I get. It's a few topics. We've got style and clothing. We've got food. We've got rituals, culture. I've added a special topic for you called Bay, and we've got about you. Now, underneath them are some little questions. Some are there to trip you up. The others is just a bit to get to know you. So let's just kick off, I reckon, if you're ready. Let's do it. All right. 
First, we start with style and clothing, and this is all about talking loft. This is all about caps, caskets, capolinos, mini cycling caps, whatever you want to call them. How do you wear yours? How, what's your style? Do you wear it forwards? Do you wear it backwards? Do you cut the hole in the back to get the ponytail through it? Do you like to pull it straight down like a swimming cap? What is your style? We'll wear a little cycling cap sometimes in the rain, but then always definitely got to poke a hole in the back for the ponytail. Um, that's a, an essential uh, for sure. But really, my favorite um, sort of cap is is absolutely the bucket hat that we have. <laughs> but that's not for all the bike sort of stuff. That's le- le- lifestyle. Lifestyle bucket hat. Have you ever seen a casket with a already made hole in it? I think I was talking to Hannah Barnes about it. She said she had one a few years ago that, you know, one of the manufacturers actually made a, a, pretty much a female versions of a cap to, to have the, the ponytail hole in there. I haven't had one that's already been pre-made. We just uh, slice her up to fit exactly where it, it gets to be very individual that you get to put it right where you want it. Pigtails, two on the side. That's right. <laughs> Uh, all right. Yeah, you, can get, you can get that the Tade Pagacha um, little holes so that it can come out the the top holes of your helmet. Right? That's that'd be like the ultimate like um, Andreas Taffy, you know, when he when he did the um, the visor, just just a little slit just to get the pokes of your hair out. Yeah. yeah, I like it. If you could have raced back in the day, back when no one was racing with helmets, what style would you have had? You know, because it's all about style. We're not talking about the safety of it. We all know that was crazy time. I'm talking about the style now. Would you have gone just a headband with the hair flowing, just the hair? Would you have just done, you know, a braid? I don't know. What this, what style would you have gone for? No helmet racing. Yeah. Well, I think, um, I mean, the the headband look, uh, you know, little, little keep the sweat out of the, the eye sort of thing, I think is uh, pretty boss. The the flow, like, I'm, you know, I'm a Canadian, so we love the the lettuce flow as we call it or the um that's the hockey talk <laughs> the salad look the salad mean? flow what does that mean <laughs> that's all just names that we call the really long hair that comes out the helmet the salad or um yeah you got some lettuce or some lip lettuce that's you know you you've got a little bit a lot of lip lettuce there yeah so i i probably would also like it sometimes just want to rock the the flow so that's like hair totally yeah long hair it's just yeah. flowing in the wind yeah. yeah i like it all right this is a little bit about cycling style do you like your arm warmers well do you wear your arm warmers over or under your sleeves when you get dressed for a race always under always under always yeah why i mean for so i i was national champion um so i get the you know the really nice bands of uh maple leaf on the sleeve so i'm gonna always wrap that on the outside what about when you pull them down the race you got to pull them back up when it gets a bit colder later on yeah you know once i take my arm was off they're off for good Oh, that's it. I heard this the other week from Jai Hindley. He said, once they go, they're, they're down. That's it. I'm into race mode. Yeah, and then if we have to put any other layer back on, it's going to be jacket. Gloves or no gloves? Always gloves, uh, except for Roubaix. In Roubaix, no gloves. And tell tell people why, because it, it is a funny thing to imagine that, but I, I actually, I can imagine the reason why. Yeah, I, I found that in recons and stuff, the material between your hands and your handlebar just would always rub with the little bumps. So you're not holding on to the handlebar so tight, but just that little bit of extra friction. Yeah, I found it caused me blisters in between my thumb and my fork or my you know finger um, just in the crux there or on the palm of my hands. It, was, it would just really rub too much. What about glasses under or over the helmet strap? Over, yeah. <laughs> Although we do, um, we think have these, about that for a bit. Well, we have these pot glasses that are super light, the lightest glasses I, I've ever had. And sometimes, like putting them, you really have to. For me, I have to stick them over, over the the straps, but then kind of up into the helmet, so it like stays or stick it into my hair a little bit. Otherwise, like they're so light, sometimes you don't know that they're there and they can fly off. Other girls on the team, they put them underneath the straps. Oh, right. Just purely out of just to save them. Yep. Not flying off. What about race suit or Nixon jersey? Yeah, actually, I mean, with the, the Raha suits that we wear, I, I like to wear the suit. It's, it's like a really good, a really good fit. And it's also a, a quick piece stop. Um, and that's because I got to roll, being female, I got to roll up the, the pant legs, pull them up and then over. And I can do that with the race suit, with the other um, kind of arrow bibs that we that we have with Rafa, they're so tight um, on the leg, I can't pull them up. So you'd have to undo the the jersey and then 
um, you know, your radio might fall out or whatever. So, um, so really in a, like a really intense sort of like classic race, I'll choose the, the race suit. And the rest of the time just sneaks in Jersey for, you know, a, yeah. a time if I need to go to the toilet. That's my, my choice. What about if and when you win the world championships, what are you going to do? Tell me about the style. Are you going to run the full Chippo style, white nicks, white gloves, white arm warmers, helmet, everything? Or are you going to go a bit more traditional? You're going to go black nicks, you know, more Eddie Merck style? Yeah, I think I definitely got black nicks for sure. <laughs> Seeing Naremko and all the, the the media on that. I mean, it's probably a little different for me being a female, but <laughs> I still think like also just like the laundry issue, man, I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> Give me the black. Give me what your world champ. You just be fresh Knicks every day. <laughs> That's right. Can we just like rainbow stripe the Knicks like full? I've never heard that. That'd be awesome. Like what? Maybe like a tie dye, just sort of like rainbow, sort of all over it. Yeah, or like maybe the stripes come up from one leg, like over the butt, and then down the other side, just like full rainbow. <laughs> you could definitely do it. You could do whatever you want when you're world champ. That's it. Uh, all right, let's move on to food. Let's learn a little bit about what goes on for you. Are you rice or pasta? Yeah, usually for first off, it's rice. Um, and partly that's because depending on whatever country you go to, usually the rice is gonna be the safe the safe option. Mm. Um I've had been on an Italian team um and had, you know, enough Italian uh teammates to uh sort of raise my own personal uh level of what is good pasta. If we're in Italy, I will always I'll choose the the pasta. Um, maybe not for breakfast. Breakfast, I'll still stick to. I'm a rice for breakfast um, sort of person. Also, in the in the off season, actually, uh, last year I started to learn how to make my own fresh pasta. So I thought that would be a really cool sort of project to tackle, and that was really fun. So um, yeah, I'm leaning a little bit more towards the uh, towards like the fresh pasta or pasta in uh, when I'm in Italy. That was such a roundabout way. I was on rice for a moment there. Then you got me back on pasta. And then I thought we we're going to rice and we ended with pastas, right? <laughs> well done. Yeah. Great, great sort of tricky story there. You already mentioned it a little bit now. The breakfast, the pre-race breakfast. Are you a normal breakfast person, which I thought you would have been, being, you know, being from the land of the best sort of, you know, maple pancakes, waffles with maple, or are you like a pre-race, eat your dinner at breakfast, get a rice and pasta and, you know... You know how it goes sometimes with these with these riders. What's your uh, breakfast look like? Yeah, race breakfast is rice, banana, maple syrup, and extra salt. So, and that's standard. Me, I don't eat any oats actually, um, which is like maybe bonkers for any sort of bike racer or athlete. They're like, you know, oats through and through. But uh, yeah, rice and always got to have that bit of maple. No panties. No, unless, so when I'm on my own, like training camps, um, and if I get to be in the kitchen, I'm always making happy face pancakes. And literally, <laughs> ever since I was a kid, my my mom always made pancakes with like you like put a little like the two eye dots and a little smile first in the pan, and then you put the rest of the batter on top of it. And it and when you flip it, there's a little happy face smiley face on the pancake. And literally, anytime I make pancakes, it's always like that. I'm gonna do that for my kids tomorrow. That's a great one. Yeah. When you walk into the to the bus, to the camper, wherever the race food is, what is your favorite race food? You walk up there, the Swannies have prepared it. You know what I'm talking about. You're like, oh, yes, they've got it. I love this. And you tuck it in your pocket for that one moment in the race when it's not fast and you go, thank God I've got this. Oh, definitely the rice cakes. And if there can be a salty option rice cake, a little a little ham and, ham and cheese sort of rice cake, that's absolutely mm-hmm. my favorite. Or a little little ham and cheese panini, whatever we can get, something salty. Always on the bike, it's like sweets. Um, and so, especially like stage race or anytime you can get a little salty snack, that's that's my go-to option. What about when you're going out riding, training? Are you a coffee stop person or not? Always. <laughs> I'll stop for coffee before. I'll stop for coffee in the middle. I'll stop for coffee after. Always. What coffee are you getting and- at those stops? Yeah. Yeah. Tell me. Um, yeah, you usually... Like start off, it's gonna like I love just like a batch brew, like taste the bean, um, mm-hmm. black coffee. Maybe sometimes in the middle or then at the end, it's gonna be like a little cortado, maybe a flat white, but love the little cortados. Yeah, on the ride, I'm always taking like cookies um, or any sort of baked 
bread, banana bread, brownies, cinnamon buns. Um, definitely uh, love the the pastry cake. Yeah. Cinnamon bun, just tuck a couple of them in the pockets. Oh, yeah. I mean, even uh, like I love, I call the, the Rafa cargo pants, the, the pancake pocket pants. And uh, I just like to stuff like slides of pancakes, uh, pancake stacks in in the the pockets on the on the thigh there. Just a little quick, easy uh, snack. Are they what? Are they pre-soaked in maple, or are you just having them dry? No, <laughs> they are pre-soaked in maple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I thought so. Tell me about this. The one time, you know, we're always doing lockdowns. We've all got to you know trim up and focus on a race. But that one time, we go, that's it. I'm done. I'm letting the hair down. It's cheat meal time. I've just won Roubaix. I'm coming home. What is that meal? What's that one thing you look forward to when you really let yourself go? Yeah, you can't go wrong with a with like a, a hamburger, but like with all the things on it. So it's like hamburger, bacon, cheese. It's got like all the mayo, all the sriracha mayo with your potato wedges, just like full spent. Poutine on the side. Not, I'm not quite. The, you know, the, the the cheese and the gravy on the on the the fries. That um, what do we eat that on Canada Day? I guess. All right, let's move on. Rituals, crosswinds or mountains. Yeah, I'm going to take the crosswinds. I love the little bit of chaos that that is. I mean, like I love the mountains and the views, but um, hmm. yeah, for for racing, uh, I guess like training, I would take the mountains. But racing, I love the the crosswind chaos. You wouldn't want to just go out in a nice big. You know, flat right into, you know, oh, crosswind on the left, can't wait to turn right, crosswind on the right. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> yeah, sometimes actually that from where I grew up in Alberta, it's just like flat prairie lands and it's always windy, but it always seems to be that like headwind. No matter which direction you're going, it's just like headwind. Too much for me. <laughs> training or racing? I love racing. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, like... I- the training part is fun, but if I, but um, what I really love about bike racing is that you we have so many events in the year. Like I used to be a runner, or you know when I was younger too, I was a triathlete. But you you know as a triathlete, you get like five races maybe in the year that are kind of key races, and you just prep for those, and that's it. Running is the same thing. You you kind of like build up so much training to do just a couple of events. But yeah, the racing is where you get to pull out all these like stories and you know it's like after the race um you're sitting on the bus with all your teammates just talking about all the little crazy moments that happened in the race um and it just like builds up just this great file holder of stories and that's what i love about racing awesome i love it um tell me best i don't know if you want to do this but you could best and worst roommate are you gonna throw someone under the bus <laughs> or you could just say what makes the best and worst or tell us who they are yeah, best roommate is going to be someone who just like loves to laugh um, and will entertain <laughs> um, or allow me to um, either like film my silly videos or like add it, contribute to them or add into it. Yeah, love that. Or And people who love to just like listen to music. I always bring a speaker and either it's like dance party or just like discovering new tunes. Yeah, a, a roommate that either goes to bed early is a light sleeper um and just like wants quiet then that's probably not my favorite roommate at all <laughs> you're gonna throw you're gonna throw anyone out there who's your favorite roommate uh lately i've been uh rooming with uh, zoe backstead a ton and uh she loves the tunes loves the dance parties good vibes uh so that's pretty fun i haven't um actually had a, i haven't had um a bad roommate although we do have a, a one girl on the team who goes to bed so early like if she can't it's like 8 a.m and then she's waking up at 4 a.m that's like not my schedule no not, i don't think many people's schedule tell me do you have any superstitions you know like knock on wood or you know maybe a little dance move you do before you head out in the race or i used to have this superstition i don't know why I, well i thought it was a really nice thing to do i'd i'd message my wife before i went out of the bus but then it became this thing or I had to message her. You know, it wasn't really about messaging her. It was this superstition. I'd you know, forget and ride back to the bus, send her a message, you know. Have you got any weird things like that that you um, have sort of got yourself into? No, really not. I think it's probably like, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not so ritualistic or like even structured so much. I'm just like really like probably like more on the hippie side. So really, you know, it'd be like whatever I'm feeling in the moment is going to be um, good enough. So yeah, not so many, not any rituals really. Even the it's like not being not being structured. That's your ritual. Well, no, I'm getting too structured. <laughs> True, you got to break break the mold. 
Yeah, I think even like, you know, the how I put on my kid or what I do um, is probably always, you know, different every time. Maybe like one ritual that I have is I always, I don't pin my number the night before I all pin it like on the bus. During the DS meeting, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. At the at the 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 last minute that I can do things. Yeah, they love that. They really love that when you do that. Let's talk about a bit of culture, cycling culture. We'll just punch through this. Favorite rider of all time. I mean, yeah, one of my favorite riders is is Swain Cup, and I think it's because of like how he came into the sport um, late. But he had this really like long term plan of how he was going to do it, and he just like stuck into it. He tried all these like different weird sort of things just to like test out like what could work well for him or not. Um, But also he just has all these like wild story, wilderness stories um, that that really creates this legend around Swain Tups. And I just like, I love those stories. I tell those stories. I might even like tell them in a bigger way, just create adding to the legend of Swain Tups. Yeah, that's a really, really good one. Nice one. Tell me about the favorite, your favorite rider right now. Well, I I really do. Uh, I love Lava Kapeki. Um, and one on one hand, I don't want to choose any SD Works riders because they're winning everything and it's annoying. <laughs> but um, yeah, Lada is uh, like really focused um, on on racing and preparation. But I also think she's like a dynamic rider and can and and really wants to try to win races in different ways. And, I think that's what makes like a, an exciting rider and she just, yeah, loves to race. Best moment in a race. So, you know, the race gets going, maybe it's that neutral zone, probably not the neutral zone. It could be that first kilometer. It could be when the break actually goes or it could be finally coming on the Lanton Rouge. Or, sorry, the Flam Rouge, not the Lanton Rouge. 1K to go. I've made it. Finally. What's your favorite moment in a race? I mean, uh, yeah, I guess that depends on like, you know what how's the race playing out or what's going on i mean i remember in uh in valencia we had this like hard stage you know it's like early early season and uh we had these two mountain two mountains that we had to go over and oh it was crazy in the race before like everyone trying to attack getting the breakaway i'm trying to get in the breakaway but it's just like full gas and i'm on the limit and as soon as we hit that first climb and the climbers go and i look around and you know the the couple of sprinters um Balsamo and and some other girls just immediately stood up and I was like, okay, oh, like I didn't have to thank God. I was just waiting for the moment the Gruppetto would start and you can just let up and then just like chill zone and you just get a chat with all your pals that are in, in the Gruppetto you enjoy the ride and stuff. Oh, that was like, I'd been waiting like all day or like hours just to keep by just like, when is this Gruppetto going to start? <laughs> that's, that's, I think that's the best bit. That's exactly one of my favorite moments. You're like, yes, I can just Oh, let go. I'm going to make it. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. On the flip side of that, what's the worst moment in the race? You're just like, I hate this bit, you know, like the neutral zone. Would everyone just calm down or why hasn't the break gone yet? Seriously. What is the worst moment in the race for you? Yeah. I think actually sometimes it's like when you, for me, it's if you miss the break and then now we're just like sitting up um, and just like waiting for the race to end, basically. Um, that part, I just like, uh, I'd rather, I just want to either be in the action or like make something happen or have something exciting. And if you're just like rolling around or, you know, everyone's like wanting it to be a sprint day. So nothing is going and we're all just like sitting in, then it just like, uh, you just like wait, watching the clock tick by just to get to the finish. Tell me what's the one move in the bunch that you just will not stand for. You know, you see it happen often. It could be everyone blocking at the front and then, you know, someone goes around on the grass or it could be someone, I don't know, helmet bopping someone or I don't know, maybe it's slightly different in the women's peloton. What's something that you see is like, that's it. I I hate when that happens. Yeah. Well, I think what, what I hate is like when everyone is like teams are always trying to get in the breakaway. So all these girls are, or they chase you down, but then they chase you down and they don't pull through. And then you're like, well, what? Like you're trying to get in the breakaway, like ride the breakaway. Don't just like exist here. That is, that to me is so annoying. They're like, oh yeah, I got here. Now like you, you drive us away. You just do everything. You're like, uh, don't think that's how it's going to work here. No. Tell me, what is your favorite kit of all time? That one kit that you think it just sits in your mind. You loved it. You love the look of it. It's bright. It's not bright. I don't know. What's that favorite kit that you really remember and love? Maybe it's right now. I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, I do have to say my uh, like national championship kit, um, the first time I won, and it, for that 
that second half of the season, I had these red shorts <laughs> and then the jersey with like red sleeves and the maple leaf in the middle. So it like really was like end of play. But also I could I mean, that was such wearing red shorts is quite a statement. Um, but I loved it in the bike race. Like it just it, it also just like accentuated that like my first, you know, championship win and it was just like very obvious and I loved it. But what's also funny is trying to wear that kit in like around Girona or somewhere like anywhere you go, you just get stared at because it's like so wild, very loud, but I loved it. That's awesome. And finally here in culture, cobbles or gravel? I mean, you'd think maybe I would say cobbles that I love cobbles, but you know, since Perry Roubaix, but how I ride Perry Roubaix is trying to avoid all the cobbles and ride in that gutter. Um I do really love the, I mean, the gravel road i think like you can um i guess it's more like the spirit of gravel is like adventure and the spirit of gravel is like social um time with your with your friends when you're riding um when you're going out to hit all these cobbles it's not really a social ride that you're doing on the cobbles so uh, i'm gonna have to go gravel well, yeah, that, I think that's, that's a valid point. You're not just going out for a cruisy one on the cobbles. Yeah, should we go cruise around on the cobbles today? This should be so fun. You're <laughs> sort of not really ever doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of cobbles, now I've got a new topic for you, Roubaix. Now, there's a few questions here. They're more, it's a bit of a quiz, actually. It's a Roubaix quiz. All right, you ready to rock and roll? Oh, my gosh. All right. Can you name all the positions you have finished in your three editions of Paris Roubaix? Yeah, 24th, 13th, and 1st. Well, well done. That's a good start. I like it. A little <laughs> bit harder now. How long is the track at Roubaix, the velodrome? Oh, yeah. It's a funny number. Four or five meters. Or so. From what I can find out, it's an, it's an even number. It's not a track length that you will ever find really anywhere. It really yeah. just threw me out. It's super <laughs> long. You're in, the, you're in the right sort of area. It's, it's, it's bigger than what you said, though. Do you want to have another stab? I still think it's like 400 something, but maybe like 480. As far as I could find, it was 500, but it might be like 498 or something. I think it's really close. Right. Okay. It's, it's crazy. You don't you don't think it's that long, do you? You think it's like a 333 or something when you're going around there like a normal outdoor track. Yeah, but I mean, so sometimes I think it's almost like bigger than, uh, well, also the track that I'm familiar with mostly is like the Burnaby Velodrome in Canada, which is like a 200 meter track. So it's very... T- tight yeah i sometimes think like an outdoor track it just like makes it look bigger because it's open um and then also kind of when you go into the roubaix velodrome already you sort of have these stars in your eyes like the whole you you imagine that because it's such a big race and such a big finale that it just sort of the whole thing just seems like it's going to be bigger you know it's a good way of looking at it yeah awesome can you name five of the Perry roubaix sectors uh, sector 17, sector 16. <laughs> okay, yeah. We got, um, well, Monzam, uh Carrefour de Labra. Hmm. Oh, it's been a while since I looked at it. Well, we got the Roubaix sector. I think they just called the Roubaix sector the little little bit before Roubaix. Oh, open it up. It's, it's men's and female edition. I'm not going to just narrow it down to yours. Open it up. They'll give you a few more sectors to work with. One famous one you can name there. Aronberg Forest. Well done. You got three. Yeah. Um, what? A- no, we got we got no. Orishis. Well done. Four. Pretty easy one. Second last sector. You were driving it across there. They have got the barriers on the side now. Starts with eight. Yeah, yeah, but that's a good one. You got four. <laughs> Can you think of any more? It's pretty hard I'm, to remember them. Yeah, I. I what's funny is like, um, I made this spreadsheet out of out of all, of all those sectors, but yeah. What about your first sector? You can maybe just name the rider that it's named after. It's got two names now. Oh, is that the the new Eddie Merckx? It's the John Degenkob sector. Oh, John. John O. Yeah. All right. There was him, the other sector I was talking about before. You did pretty well, though. That was good. I really thought I, should, I would do better at that. But... All right. Who is known as Mr. Perry Roubaix? Is it A, Tom Boonen, B, Roger de Flaming, or C, Eddie Merckx? Tom Boonen. Bam, bam. He is, he is, he has won it equally four times, but Roger de Vlami, he, ha, he was known as Mr. Perry Roubaix. That was close, though. Mm. Um, I, I loved after the race, actually, like racing Amstel Gold on the course. There's so many people yelling out 
like, go, Mrs. Roubaix, <laughs> which I loved. Well, I've actually got a glass question of Roubaix is who is known as Mrs. Perry Roubaix? And I've made a new way of working this out. Could be right, could be wrong. I.e., the writer who has had the best results in all three editions. Is it A, Elisa Longa Borghini, B, Lotta Capecchi, or C, Alison Jackson? Like, like Longa Borghini has also won the race. So that like starts her off with a low number. But I think like even in the the group sprints that she's come into, then it hasn't been um, so good for her. So, and then Lotta Capecchi has had great, great rides. I guess it was last year's edition. She had quite a few mechanicals and stuff, so finishing a little bit behind. And I don't know. Mm. Did she, though? First. How far behind did she finish? Mm, interesting. Yeah, still. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm going to go a lot of Kentucky. And what about you? You're not considering yourself? No, I think Three that... results. I think the 24th position on the first year uh, brings down my average. Well, you've done a good guess. Well done. Lotta Kopecky is the winner. She has had 24. She's finished 15th, 2nd, and 7th. Mm-hmm. You 24th, 13th, and 1st. And Elisa is 3rd, 1st. But then she had a blowout, 27th. Yeah. Oh, that's tight, though. Yeah, well, it was good. I just, so, do you think that's a good way of um, determining Mrs. Perry Yeah, I think that might be all right. Um, actually, no, what I prefer, I think, is Mrs. Perry Roubaix is uh, whoever the, the most recent winner is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy with that. Un- until the- until there's someone who's won two editions. Correct. All right. And so, and then next year, you can be that person. Well done. Right. Nice. All right. Last topic. Let's do this. About you, headphones or no headphones when you're out riding? You know, I always bring headphones. But a lot of times, like I, lo- I love music, but I, mostly I love music to like dance to or sing along to, um, or kind of like have it around in in the house. Oh yeah, a lot of times when I'm riding, I just un- entertain myself with my thoughts and the views of what's going on in the bike ride. But I always bring them along just in case it's like we're coming home and I'm bonking and it's that headwind and I just need that little bit of extra motivation to get me back. Nice. Do you read books or watch Netflix when you're uh, in the hotel room? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't actually watch a lot of Netflix, but I do watch a lot of YouTube. And whether it's like like little comedy shorts or late night shows, or I watch a lot of dance videos, like choreography dance videos or whatever. That, that's my, my jam. BWS, beer, wine, or spirits? What's your poison of choice? Wine. Yeah, for sure. Wine. Ooh. Yeah. Wow, straight to it. What sort of wine are we talking? Top preference, a red wine. Um, but I love also the stories behind, um, you know, wines and the winery and the winemakers. And I think any wine that's got a great story and made by good people, it's going to be a good wine. But then also, yeah, like living in Spain um, for the last couple of years, like the wine is just unreal. So you like the big, robust reds, you know? The big Spanish, you know, Riojas, you like, you know, even even in Catalonia there, they've got some big reds as well. That's your style? Yeah, probably actually a little, um, maybe not so like Merlot-ish or deep, a little bit more on the like lighter side of the wines. Like some of the ones from Importia are just like a little bit lighter um, or like a Pinot Noir that, yeah, or or ones that like uh, Rosés also love or like I love a Bubbly Cava, uh, especially like in the, you know, uh, summertime, love that. <laughs> I love how we drifted from reds to to lighter reds to to rosés to, yeah, to, totally. to bubblies. Love it. Yeah, just cover cover it all. I like it. All right, C C C, cake, cheese or chocolate? Cake. Favorite cross training exercise? What's the one thing you like to do that's not riding? You know what I was doing? Um, <laughs> I actually had taken my rock trophy out and I was doing some. Uh, Kettlebell swing. I'm telling you, this this trophy is not is not just um yeah shelf decoration. Tell me, everyone's got one of these. It's one of those days you're just out there. You know, the Giro generally produces these. It's just a really tough race. We've seen it this year in the men's Giro. How horrible that is. And there's those days where you're just out there. What is one of those days for you? What's a war story that you can remember? It doesn't necessarily have to be from that. It could be from a training ride. I don't know. One of those days you just go, oh, 
That bloody day. Yeah, I can think about uh, the, I've, I've had a lot of rainy day rides and long rides um, out in Vancouver um, in the winter where it's just rain and then cold. And when you get, you know, you get out on your loop and then you have to come back and it's just like the rain is in your bones. And when you get back, you, you can't even get the, the keys to your house where you're in it in your pocket and I remember one time getting to my house and I couldn't get the keys out I couldn't move my hands and I'm just like standing at my front door just crying my eyes out and the neighbor comes by and I'm like can you please help me get the keys and it, it's also like I feel like I'm being like super extra dramatic <laughs> but the poor neighbor just like feels so bad for me like taking the key out and, the, and then like opening the door for me and then basically I just like walked with all my stuff on straight into the warm shower and just like until you know you get all those like tinglies of your of your fingers and feet until you can like you can use them again and then and then stripping down but oh man that was that, I've, I, I've had a couple of those days that are super rough days your neighbor's just looking at you going what are you doing why are you even doing this you know sport yeah exactly the days everyone's like oh rainy day time to like curl up by the fire not me finally tell me the last question off the back of that which would be interesting to know what is the best thing about riding a bike why do you still ride a bike why do you go out on those days and continually go back and do it what do you love about riding a bike oh yeah i mean i I love the places you can go and you can see but i also just i love like testing the body The, the human body is just like an amazing thing that and the human spirit um, just being resilient or, you know, being able to this positivity or self-talk that you give yourself to make it through some of those things. Like even on that terrible ride, I remember coming home and just thinking, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to call my, my partner and just say like, okay, you got to come pick me up. When I got on the phone with him, then it was like, and then we're just like talking through and he was like, oh, should I come pick you up? And I was just like, actually, no, I'm okay. <laughs> and I just, you know, just in these little moments are like, what, the resiliency of the human spirit is is really something that's just like amazing um and and you know to see what your body can do or like after the ride it just becomes like this great story to tell like i love i love saying that i I make a great dinner guest because i just have all these stories collected from you know these like ridiculous moments but i think um you know it's like even with your family you go camping and if it's all sudden you know you barely remember that camping trip but if it's like terrible weather and you're making these like really strong sort of memories at the time it probably sucks it's terrible but after it just is like this really strong bonding memory so you're saying to everyone out there when the sun's shining don't bother wait for the the horrible day otherwise you're not going to remember it yeah or you got to add something hard into that so you know Take, take a wrong turn, just go, you know, travel down a new road, hit some gravel and uh, yeah, make, make the most of the day, make it memorable. Awesome, Allison. Loved it. Thank you very much for being on Talking Love. Yeah, this was fun. Thanks, Mitch. There we have it. Talking Luft, Alison Jackson. What a couple of weeks that was. A great guest on Life in the Peloton. I really enjoyed having her on in both those episodes. Like I said, if you haven't heard the first episode, go back and listen to that. You're doing yourself a disfavor by not hearing that. Of course, Talking Luft, I know you've just enjoyed that episode right now. I've got some exciting news. We're on the cusp of the Tour de France. And yes, next week I've got him. The legend himself, Cadell Evans. This is the Cadell Evans story. I go into a bit of stuff I haven't heard him talk about before because we're both from Melbourne. We're both from the north side of Melbourne. So we get into a little bit about where he grew up and talk about the back roads and things that he used to ride that I ended up going out and training on and learning the ropes myself. We've got that similarity. That's probably where it ends when it comes to racing bikes. Guys, this podcast doesn't happen without a few important people, and that is Will Jones, who pieces these episodes together for me, doing a great job behind the scenes, Meg and Spurlow as well in the Life in the Peloton team, and of course, our major partner, Rafa. Love working with these guys this year. But last but not least, you guys for listening and giving me that feedback. So guys, until next week, a very special episode. I'm Mitch Stocker. Cheers. The music in this episode was composed by Pete Shelley. Cheers, mate.